morning, everybody. It sounds like game night in here is what it sounds like. We had a, we had a great time Friday night. Uh, I really do. You should come out next time. It was it was great. We had a ton of people. Well, it's good to be back. Um, I, I've been gone for a couple of weeks. Uh, my family and I went on vacation, and you know you'd think I'd be rested after something like that, um, but uh, we came back and. And then we had the uh, first week of school, and we also got a brand new puppy. So, which is, you know, cute, but not, not sleeping through the night yet. So if I seem a little bit tired, that's, that's why. Uh, I'm excited today. We're going to be jumping back into our series in Genesis. We've been going through the book, and today we are covering one of my favorite chapters. And uh, this is definitely my favorite chapter in Genesis, but this is one of my favorite chapters in the, in the whole Bible. Uh, there's, there's a lot here, and so we're going to be in Genesis chapter 15 today. So go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 15. And as we look through this, we are going to be asking this question. What, what do we do with our doubts? What do we do with our doubts? You know, doubts is, our, we all have doubts about many different things. And this is actually, our doubts are one of the reasons that um, God, I think, prompted me to go through the book of Genesis, because a lot of people have a lot of doubts about the book of Genesis, right? We tend to think about, okay, what's the, what's the deal with creation? Is it a real thing? You know, what about evolution, the flood? Did that really happen? And so a lot of people have those types of doubts when it comes to the book of Genesis. And so we've been talking about those as we've been going through it. But there, so there are those kinds of doubts where we're like, I'm not sure if I understand this or I, or I think this really happened. But then there's doubts when it comes to God's promises to us. When God speaks about your life, you know, God says, hey, I'm, I'm with you always. And we say, okay, God says that, but sometimes I really feel alone. I feel like I'm all by myself. Or the Bible tells us that God works all things for the good. And we look at our lives sometimes and think, I, I don't see how that could be. How can God use this? for good. Or maybe you're in a situation where God's called you to something or he's prompted you, he's put something on your heart. And so you start following, you start, you start going the direction God's, direct, that God's leading you and you end up enca- encountering struggles and opposition. And you start thinking, did, is this really what God asked me to do? Or did I hear him wrong? Or did I make this whole thing up? These are the kind of things we're going to be talking about as we go through this chapter. So make your way to Genesis chapter 15, if you're not already there, and we're going to pray, and then we'll go into this. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you're with us, that you're with us always, and I pray that this time you would open our hearts and ears to hear directly from you, God, because you want to speak to each of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so it's been a while since we've been in Genesis, so we're going to catch you up to where we are. So we're in the middle of this story of a man named Abram. We're at a time thousands of years ago, right after the flood, God called a man named Abram to follow him. Abram was just a regular guy, worshiping idols just like the rest of the world. And God said, follow me, come with me. And he said, I'm going to lead you to a land. He gave, God gave Abram several promises. He said, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to make you into a nation. Your descendants are going to multiply and to become a nation. He said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your allies. I'm going to curse your enemies. And I'm going to bless the whole world through your line. These are some amazing promises, aren't they? These are the promises that God gave to Abram. But in doing so, he said, now follow me. He said, go where I lead you. You're going to go to a land that I will show you. I want you to leave your home, leave your town, leave your family, and go where I tell you. And amazingly, Abram goes. And this is not at a time, you know, where Abram just didn't load up a U-Haul and get on a 50, you know. This is, this is back before all that. Abram had to load, load everything in his carts. He had to leave the safety of a, of a city. He had to go, you know, kind of think of prairie style, right? He's just kind of forging a path, going wherever God told him to, hoping he doesn't run into wild animals or, or, you know, roving bandits or a city that's hostile toward him. 
He doesn't know what's out there. There's no maps. There's no GPS. There's no pit stops along the way. And God says, I will show you where to go. Just follow me. And so Abram does it. And Abram ends up in a, situa- in a place where God has led him to this land. He's brought his nephew, Lot. And in those days, you had kind of your tribe. So Abram didn't go by himself. He brought his, his wife and his tribe, and, and Lot had his tribe. Well, they ended up in a situation where they all had cattle, and they, you know, there wasn't enough land, and so they had to split. And so Abram and Lot decided, okay, we're, you're going to go this direction, I go this direction. And Lot cr- crossed the river and ended up li- uh, living right next to a city called Sodom. You may have heard of this city, Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to talk about those two later. But for now, Lot moved near the city of Sodom, and eventually he moved into the city of Sodom. Well, the problem is this city, Sodom, along with uh, four other cities in the area, they were under the control of a, of a king who, who lived quite a ways away. They, were, they had been sort of conquered, and they were to pay tribute. You know, they pay their taxes every year. Well, who likes paying taxes, right? So after a while, these cities decide, you know what? We're not, sending, we're not sending any tribute this year. And so they don't. Well, the foreign king doesn't like this. Remember, this, this guy's named Keter Laomer is the king's name. He doesn't get his tribute one year, and he's, like, he's not going to have that. So he gets this coalition together. They go down. They, de- they defeat these cities again, kind of the beat down for, for rebelling against him. And he takes off. He heads back to his land. And when he goes, he takes along with him a lot of possessions and a lot of the people from those different cities. And included in that was Abram's nephew, Lot, and his family. So Lot's been captured. He's being taken to a distant land. And Abram, when he hears about this, he gets some of his allies, some of his friends. They pool their their tribes together. They go on a search and rescue mission. And they... They use some tactics, they, they ambush them at night, and they end up getting everything back. They, they run off the enemies, the Keterleomer's uh, army and his friends, and they get Lot back and all the possessions back, and they come back to the city of Sodom and those other cities. And the city of Sodom, they're obviously very grateful. The king, he's very grateful. And so he says, thank you for getting my people. Why don't you keep all the stuff, keep all the possessions as a reward? And Abram says, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to be. Able, I don't want to say that you. I don't want to be able to anyone to be able to say that you made me rich. And so he rejects the the reward, but then he goes to this guy Melchizedek. Do you remember talking about him, the king of of Salem, the king of peace, this this mysterious Melchizedek? And we looked at how Melchizedek was a representation of Jesus Christ. Some believe that he actually was Jesus Christ himself. But at the, very, at the very least, he represented Jesus Christ. And we see Abram going to him and aligning with him, giving him his tithes, giving him his support. That's all in Genesis chapter 14. So then Abram goes back to his home. And that's where we're at in the story now. So Abram's just rescued his nephew, and he's back at home. So Genesis chapter 15 says this, After this, So after that, all that I just said. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. When the word of the Lord came, to, or then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So after this, after this period, God comes to Abram and says, don't be afraid, Abram. Now, many times when we read through the Bible, whenever people have an encounter with the Lord, or even just an angel of the Lord, they usually start off with, don't be afraid. And many times it's because when you encounter an angelic being, or when you encounter God himself, people are afraid. God is incredibly powerful. 
You know, many people, I've heard it said, you've probably heard it said, people will say, you know, when I get to heaven, I've got some questions for God. He's got to answer for some things. There's no biblical basis for that. <laughs> Anytime in scripture people see, encounter God, they fall on their face and they're afraid. And God has to say, don't worry, don't worry, it's okay. So that may be what's going on here. It may be that Abram is afraid of God. But I don't actually think that that's what's happening here. I think here God is actually speaking into Abram's life. I think Abram here has, is, has fear uh, of men, fear of man in his life. And you may think, well, why would that be? He just conquered these kings. He just was victorious. Why would he have fear? Have you ever been in a situation where you have to do something kind of risky or daring or dangerous because, you know, there's a, maybe a kid involved or something, something's involved where it's like you've got to get involved and your adrenaline's pumping and you go through it and it's all good. And then afterwards you're sitting there thinking, what did I just do? You ever done that before? I think that's what Abram is experiencing here. He just went on this rescue mission, defeated a coalition of kings, and then he came back. And now it doesn't say he killed the en enemy army. It says he routed them. He ran them off. So it could very well be Abram's coming back to his tent and thinking, he might come back. He's probably not happy with me. He's got several kings. I'm just a, you know, I've got my tribe, but he's got an army. What, what, if, what if he comes back? He'd probably be very nervous about that. And not only that, the, when the king of Sodom offered this reward, he was giving him a reward, but also kind of offering this alliance. You know, here, take this, we'll be, a lot, we'll be um, allies, I'll protect you, you protect me, that kind of a thing. And Abram rejected that. He said, no, I'm not going to ally with you, I'm going to go with God. And now he's probably thinking, well, maybe, was, that, was that wise? That was a lot of money he was offering. It wasn't money, but it was cattle, and that was a lot of wealth he was offering me. Maybe that wasn't a good financial decision. And now he's not going to protect me if... What's going to happen here? And here we see God coming and say, don't be afraid, Abram. He says, I'm your shield. I'm your reward. Don't worry about a retaliation. I will protect you. I'm your shield. Don't worry about the fact that you turn down all that money. I'm your reward. And so when God comes to Abram and says this, I'm your reward, you would think Abram would say, oh, that's, that's great, God. That's amazing. Thank you. But that's not what Abram says he kind of starts this complaining. He says, but Lord, what can you give me? I don't have any children. Now, if you remember when, what I, when God called Abram, one of the promises was, I will make you into a nation. You will become a people group, which now we know is the people of Israel. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to make you a nation. Well, that promise, when God originally called Abram, Abram was 75 years old at the time. He didn't have any children then. He doesn't have any children at this point. And this is roughly 10 years later. Abram's now 85 with no kids. You think it's hard to have a kid at 75? Try having a kid at 85. And so Abram's like, God, I, I don't know if you realize this, but I don't have any kids. It's hard to, have, hard to make a nation out of someone with no kids. It's kind of funny, isn't it? Who would talk to God that way? Well, don't we do this? We do this, don't we? God, I don't know if you realize, but my health isn't doing so good. Do you see that? God, I, I don't know if you see what's going on here, but this relationship I'm in, it's not, it's not going well. God, my, my children, I, are you watching this? They're, they're going the wrong direction. This is how Abram's talking to God. And then, just to take it another step further, he tells God what's going to happen. He tells God the future. He says, and by the way, God, a servant is going to be my heir. I don't know if you can see, I don't know if you can connect the dots, God, but here we go. This is how it's going to play out. It sounds ridiculous when I explain it this way, but we do this, don't we? I've done it, you've done it. God, I don't know if you see this, but... I'm headed for divorce. God, I'm headed for bankruptcy. Do you see this, God? 
Let me connect the dots for you. The funny thing is when we look into the future, we have this assumption that God's not going to do anything. When we look into the future, we're looking at a future where God doesn't, in, doesn't get involved. And the funny thing is when we look in the past, we say, oh my goodness, God was working here and here and here and here, and I didn't even realize it. But when we look in the future, we say, well, but God, if you don't do something, the thing is, as believers, we can be sure of one thing about the future. I mean, if, if this whole pandemic has proved anything, it's that we don't know the future, right? But we do know this. God will be involved. God is going to intervene. He's going to step in and do something. What is that something? I can't tell you that, but I guarantee he will do something. Amen. So this is what Abraham's telling God. God, you may not understand this situation, but let me tell you, I've got no kids, and I'm going to leave all my stuff to a servant. And so how does God respond to this? Well, God reassures Abram. He reiterates his promise. He says, no, this servant's not going to be your heir. You are going to have a son. From your own body, you're going to have a son. Well, not from his body, but you know what I mean. Of your own flesh and blood. And I find this interesting because... He's talking to God right now. Abram is talking to God. And God could have easily said and be totally justified. He could have said, Abram, how dare you? How dare you question my integrity? I'm God. You know what? You're out. I'm going to go find someone else and do it with them instead. But that's not what he does. He reassures him. He says, no, Abram, this is still the plan. The promise still stands. And I think this is important for us to note because, like I said, we have doubts, don't we? We all have doubts. I have them. You have them. And many times, and unfortunately, in many churches, they say, well, you know, if you're not sure about something, you just need to stop thinking about that and just trust God more. Right? That's not what you're ever going to hear at Park Community. We encourage you to work through your doubts to work them through with God. Let's figure these things out together. And that's what Abram did. When Abram, Abram had these doubts, you know, he's been thinking about this promise for 10 years and still no child. And so what he does is he takes that to God. He says, God, I don't understand this. It doesn't seem like this is going to work. And God says, no, this promise still stands. And then he takes him outside. He says, go, go outside Look at the stars and see if you can count them. That's how many your children will be. Have you ever been outside on a dark night? There was one time where uh, I used to be in, in a band, and we would um, you know, travel all around doing shows. And one time we were on our way to Idaho, and we, we um, were driving through. It's the middle, I think it was around midnight, and, you know, because we're a band, it's like we see the Welcome to Idaho border, and it's like, well, you got to stop and take a picture for the fans, right? And so um, we do that. We, get, we stop, we get out, we take a picture. And there, we're in the middle of the night. There's no cars on the freeway. And we realize, like, this sign is out in the middle of nowhere. And we realize, we look around, there's no lights anywhere. And so we turn off the car, and there's no, no clouds in the sky. It was a moonless night. And the stars were just, they're undescribable. I don't know if you've ever experienced that where you've been outside, no trees around. It's just, it's just a black line and then stars. And it was the, one of the most incredible experiences I ever had. When you see things like that, it just makes you feel so small, doesn't it? You realize how big the universe is. And Isaiah 40 verse 12 says, that God measures the heavens with the breadth of his hand. We see this giant you know, space and stars and all these things. I don't know if you've been looking um, online at the, the James Webb telescope. Have you seen any of those new pictures? They just launched kind of like Hubble 2.0, and so they're getting new amazing pictures. If you like space, you should go look online. They have some amazing new pictures of space. And... And it, but God says, oh, that giant thing? Yeah, it's about that big. 
It really restores perspective of who God is and what power he is capable of. So Abram brings his doubts to God. And instead of getting shamed and disciplined, God reassures him. Nope, your, the plan's still good. My, the promise still stands. And he takes him outside, shows him the stars to kind of restore his perspective. Remember who you're talking to. I'm the God that placed the stars in the sky. And then we get to one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible, in my opinion. Verse 6. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is the gospel message right here. This is, in the Old Testament, salvation by grace through faith. You know, if you ask, if you go on the street and ask the average person, how, how do you get to heaven? How do you be right with God? Most of the time, you're going to get something along the lines of, well, you got to do more good than bad, right? That's what most people think in some sense or another. They call it karma. They call it good works. They call it different things, but it all boils down to you got to do more good than bad. And they, they kind of, we kind of visualize this as a ledger, right? There's kind of this bank account and on, on this side, you've got all our debits, right? Anytime we do something bad, add a debit, add a debit, add a debit. And then we think on this side is all our good stuff. Do something good. It's a credit. It's a credit. It's a credit, right? And we're saying, we hope we have more credit than we do debit. And that's a decent view. The only problem is we don't have as much credit as we think we do. <laughs> and our debit side is much, much too big. This term here, we see, we tend to think we've got to earn our salvation, right? We've got to earn it. We've got to do more good than bad so we can, we can make it into heaven or paradise or whatever people think. We've got to earn it. But here it says, Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abram didn't earn anything. Abram believed the Lord and God said, all right, I'm depositing this giant lump of righteousness in your bank account. That's what he's doing here. And you think about it, this is before, this is Abram. This is before there were any laws, any of the Jewish laws. You know, God gave the Israel a bunch of laws he wanted them to follow. This was before all that. This is before circumcision. Abram wasn't baptized. He didn't have communion. He didn't say the sinner's prayer. He didn't do many of the, any of the things that we would normally think you have to do to be saved. He just believed God. And this belief, we've talked about it before. Belief, it's not just, oh, I agree with that. I think it's true. It's, yes, I think it's true, but I'm going to live as if it's true. That's what Abram's doing here. Abram had faith in God, and because of that, God credited him righteousness. Abram did not earn anything. It was a gift from God. So God brought Abram to this point. He prompted him. Abram responded with faith. And because of that faith, God gave him righteousness. He saved him. This is an important point. It's, this is described or talked about in the New Testament in several places. If you want to write these down, if you're interested. But in Romans chapter 4, Galatians 3, and James chapter 2. All these places talk about this, this line right here. It's an incredibly important point. Our, our salvation is a gift from God. We cannot earn it. We don't deserve it. It is a gift. So let's continue on. Verse 7. It says, He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. So first, God reminds Abram of who, he, of who God is. He says, I'm the Lord who brought you out of the land of Ur. That's where Abram was when God originally called him. He's reminding Abram of his past faithfulness. He says, I know you're worried about the future, Abram, but remember what I've already done for you. Look in the past. Connect those dots. You can see those dots. Remember, Abram, getting from 
the land of Ur to this promised land he's in now, that was a treacherous journey, a dangerous journey. And God's saying, look, I got you here safely. You're fine. And he remember, he reiterated, yes, you're going to have a son. Here he reiterates the part. He says, you will take the possession of this land. That part of the promise still stands as well. And then we get to the point where Abram's like, okay, but how will I know? I love the Bible because it's, it's real, isn't it? It's, here we see this struggle of belief and doubt. I mean, we're like that, aren't we? Abram just went through, right? God, God what about this? And God's like, look, you know, I'm going to give you a son. Look at the stars. Remember who you're dealing with. And Abram's like, I believe. But what about, <laughs> this is what we do, right? All right, God, I believe you about this. But now what about this? And, and what Abram is doing here, he's asking for a sign. Because he really did believe God, right? It was credited to him as righteousness. He really did believe. But he's still kind of struggling with it a little bit. He's, he's like, God, can you give me a sign, please? Because remember, at this point, God, Abram's been promised to be turned into a nation. A nation will come from him and he'll possess this land. And at this point in time, he has no children and no land. He has neither of those things. And so this is where, to us, it get, the story gets weird, right? God says, all right, bring me a heifer and a goat and a ram and a couple birds. And we go, what? What does this have to do with anything? But notice, Abram's not confused about this. Abram knows exactly what's going on. They're about to enter into a covenant. You see, if, if we were in an interaction and you were saying, well, how can I know you're going to do this? And I said, all right, put it in writing. Let's sign on the dotted line. You know exactly what that means, right? We're entering into, I'll enter into a contract with you. That way, you know, it'll happen. That's what's going on here. Abram's like, can there be a sign? And God's like, all right, I'll enter into this covenant with you. We'll make a contract. And so Abram, Abram knows exactly what to do with these animals. You see, he, he takes the animals, he cuts the big ones in half, and he lays them on, uh, side by side. So what he's basically doing is killing these animals and making an aisleway. So if you imagine just this aisleway with dead animals on the side is what he's doing. And uh, which I think cutting the animals in half must have taken a while, you know. And my mind goes, which way did he cut them in half? Was it lengthwise? or I don't know. Don't think about it too much. Um, <laughs> So today, when we enter into a contract, we, we spell everything out on paper, right? We say, okay, this person's going to do this. This person's responsible for this. And if you don't do this, this happens. If you don't do this, this happens. And then we sign, right? That's how we do contracts. Well, in this day, in, in Abram's day, that's not what they did. They, they were much more dramatic than, than we are. This is called uh, cutting a covenant, and what they did is they would kill the animals, they would cut them in two, they'd lay an aisle, and then the people involved in the contract would walk up and down the aisle between the pieces uh, saying the words of the covenant. This is what I promise to do. This is what I will do. And what they're saying in doing that, they're saying, I promise to do this, and if I don't, I, may I be slaughtered like these animals. May my body be broken and ripped apart like these animals. May my blood be spilled. May I be killed if I break my, my word. That's what is going on when they do that. And so when God tells Abram, okay, get the animals, cut them in half, you know, or he's, Abram, God just tells him to get the animals. Abram is, is assuming, okay, we're, we're entering a covenant. We're signing a contract. Now, remember the promises that God gave him when he called him. He's now saying, we're going to make it legal, if you will. Even though to God, when God says it, it's just as good as done anyway. But this is for Abram's uh, and our benefit. And so Abram prepares the animals. He cuts them in half. He lays them down. And this is, at this point, it's the next day, because cutting an animal in half must have taken a while, right? <laughs> get up in the morning, get the cow, cut it in half, you know. And so he's waiting there. And then he's waiting quite a long time. It says long enough that the birds of prey come down and start to pick at the animals and he has to, you know, scare them off. So continuing on verse 12, let's see what happens. It says, as the sun was setting, 
Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they served as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go on to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So Abram's sitting there with these, this isle of carnage, and it says a deep sleep falls on Abram. And this word here is the same word used when, if you remember the story of Adam, when Adam fell asleep and God made the uh, Eve out of his rib. It's the same word. So basically God kind of gave him a sedative, put him to sleep. You know, calm down, go to, go, go to sleep. And then we get through this um, statement by God of the future. Remember, Abram's like, God, just so you know, this is what's going to happen. And then God comes and says, no, th this is what's going to happen. Let me tell you. Remember, Abram wanted to know, how can I know this is going to happen? And the Lord starts off by saying, know this for certain. This is as good as done. And he goes on to describe what's going to happen to Abram's descendants and the people of Israel. He talks about how they're going to be slaves. They're going to be enslaved for 400 years. Abram's descendants will become a nation. You probably heard the story if you've been in church for a while about how they grew up, they were raised up in, in uh, Egypt and eventually Egypt turned on them and enslaved them. And they were slaves for hundreds of years. That's what he's ta God's talking about here. He said they're, your descendants are going to become slaves, but they're not going to be there forever. After 400 years, I'm going to take them out. I'm going to punish Egypt. That's the deal with, uh, you know, all the plagues on Egypt. And they're going to, you're going to come out with great wealth, great possessions. And so he, he tells all this, but he says, but Abram, don't you worry. You're going, to, you're going to die at peace at an old age. You're going to be fine. It's your descendants that will come back here. He says, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. Now, this is interesting because in, Abram, in Abram's mind, God's, God was telling him, you're going to have this land. And here God's kind of clarifying. He says, when I say you, I mean your descendants. You're not actually going to have this land. It's, it, the promise of this land that I'm giving to you is not actually for you. It's for your descendants. And this can be tricky sometimes because sometimes the things that God calls us to is not primarily for us. Sometimes he calls us or he calls you to do something that's meant to bless someone else. We often like to think, oh, God's calling me to do something. It's for my, my benefit, right? And that is true. We, we are blessed when God calls us to do something because Abram was blessed Right? He ended up with a lot of possessions and God was his shield and his reward. But God is saying, this promise is not meant for you, Abram. It's for your descendants. And then he gives a little clue as to why there's going to be this 400 year period. He says, the sin of the Amorites have not yet reached its full measure. The Amorites were the people that were living in, in the land at the time of Abram. So, there were, so Abram kind of went to this promised land but there were other people living there, the Amorites, and they were not nice people. And God is saying their sin has not yet reached its full measure. It's very interesting because it's easy to think, reading through the Bible, that God only cares about the Israelites. And he doesn't care about the rest of the world. But that is clearly not true. One of the promises God gave to Abram was, I'm going to bless the whole world through you. That's one of the reasons I'm doing what I'm doing. And here God is saying, the, I, he's giving the Amorites time to repent, to turn back to God. He's like, but they're not going to. That's interesting, isn't it? I was like, I'm giving them time to, to come back to me, but just so you know, they're not going to. And then, then I'll bring the Israelites back. See, God was saying this Amorite sin would reach a point of judgment of no return. You know, it's easy to look out into the world and think, you know, sin is just running rampant. It, they're, getting, they're getting away with it. 
Sin is just going and there's no consequence. And it's easy to lose perspective, to lose hope, isn't there? But God says, no, there's, there's a limit. You don't know when that limit is. I don't know when that limit is. But God knows. And at a certain point, judgment will come. And God is saying, the Amorites, their sin is growing and eventually I'm going to cut them off. And that's when he brings Israel in to judge them. If you've ever wondered why it's okay that the Israelites came in and killed everybody and took the land, this is why. They were a judgment on them. You know, God's heart, his desire is that everyone would turn to him. God wants everyone to turn to him. Second Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God wants everyone to come to him. He wants everyone to repent, but he knows not everyone will. And so God only tolerates sin so long before judgment comes. So continuing on, verse 17. It says, When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. So Abram's asleep. God kind of speaks this over him. And then Abram sees a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch passing between, going up and down the aisle. This is the presence of God, is what this is representing. We know this because these, the words used for the smoking fire pot and the blazing torch, they're used elsewhere of God. So this is the presence of God going up and down this aisle of carnage. Which, if you think about that for a second, is incredible. Remember what that means. God is going down this aisle saying, if I don't do what I say I will do, may my body be broken. May my blood be spilled. May I, the God of the, cre the creator of the universe, may I be killed if I don't do what I say I'm going to do. That's incredible, isn't it? That God could say that. That's an incredible statement, and yet it's even more incredible than you think. Because God passed up and down this aisle alone. He didn't say, okay, Abram, your turn. He didn't allow Abram to go up and down. And we know that in these days, typically when there was a Lord, which God is the Lord, and a servant, which is Abram, when they are making a covenant, either the servant goes by themselves right? You're pledging your commitment to the Lord, or they both go. If I do this, if you do this, right? Here we see the Lord going by himself. And what that means is God is saying, if I break this covenant, I will die. Abram, I will die if I break this covenant, but also he said, I will die if you break this covenant. Either way, if the covenant is broken, God pays the price. And this covenant God made with Abram, he was making it with Abram, but he was also making it with Israel. That's Abram's descendants. And Israel broke the covenant in every possible way, over and over and over again. And God paid the price. Jesus paid the price. He did die. He did have his body broken and his blood spilled. It's amazing, isn't it? That God would take the punishment if he messed up and he would take the punishment when we mess up. This is why I love this section. It is such a clear picture of the gospel, of what Jesus decided to do for you and for me. You know, we started off talking about our doubts, 
Abram had his doubts. You have your doubts. I have mine. Even as a pastor, I have doubts. (laughs) And yet here we see what God does with those. He says, let me show you how much you can trust me. I will pay the price even if you mess up the plan. And all we have to do today is look at the cross. We see what Jesus did for us. That he already took the penalty for our failures. We can see how much he loves us, how much he loves you, how much he loves me. And so when, God, when Jesus said, I will be with you always, and sometimes it doesn't feel like that. All we have to do is look at the cross and see what he already gave. He gave everything he had. When, we, when we, God says he can work all things for the good, and we don't, we don't see how that can be possible in this situation. We see how he took the worst possible event that ever occurred, the killing of God, and worked it for our good. If he can use that For our good, he can use anything. There's nothing worse than that. We all have doubts. And it's okay to come to God with those doubts because he's not going to beat you down for not believing hard enough. He is reassuring. Nope, I'm still with you. I'm still here. Remember what I've done for you. If 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 he's willing to do that for you, there's nothing that he's not willing to do for you. The worship team could go ahead and come on up now. We're going to spend some time right now. They're going to take communion. So actually, if the ushers can go ahead and start preparing the elements as well. We're going to take communion. And when we take communion, we're remembering what Jesus did on the cross. We're remembering how his body was broken, how his blood was spilled, how he experienced death. The God of eternity experienced death on your behalf and my behalf. Mm -hmm.